Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Streaming Alchemy Show. I'm John Mahoney, and on today's show, we're going to be taking a look at Wirecast Audio. And more specifically, we're going to be looking at how you can route audio in different ways and leverage it with external devices as well as internally in Wirecast. So we, as you know, we've been having some issues this past couple of weeks with internet bandwidth here at the studio. Uh, we are working on a couple of things that we can do differently. Uh, it is very hard to get gear at this point, uh, and so we're, we're trying to work around that. But hopefully, you know, the rest of this stream will go smoothly, and, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be back on air on a more consistent basis. So thanks for your patience here and uh, for, for sticking with us through uh, what has been a, a challenging bandwidth time here in the studio. So let's get started. Uh, I think the first thing to do, I'm going to sort of do this from scratch as we're, we're talking through this, is to go through and sort of explain. Uh, Ken, how are you? Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're going to explain a bit about how Wirecast manages uh, audio and video in the interface, and then we'll go into a bit about how we can manipulate that to use it in different ways. So. The first thing, if you look at the Wirecast interface, is that it has five main layers that it uses to essentially composite different audio and video sources in a, uh, in, in a production. And the thing to understand is that in Wirecast, you can select items from each one of these rows, each one of these layers, and they will all remain active. So this could let you do something where you put a lower third on top of a video stream or put a side panel on top of a, you know, a stream, something that you want to create a layered effect, very much like Photoshop would work with, with, with layering different graphical elements. So what I look at when I think about Wirecast for audio is that I want to put the layers that can be hidden, things like audio where you only need to hear them, you don't need to see them, put those to the bottom, and then you stack layers on top of that that you need to composite as video and graphical sources. So I'm going to start by uh, adding a device here. And so on the desk right over here, we have a, a Behringer 404. And so what we'll do is we will add the uh, inputs, the analog inputs from this device into Wirecast. So if we come back here and go through the available sources, this would be an audio capture source. So we select that. We have a lot of different things in here. But right here, I have the line one, two, and I believe I can just do this. Uh, so I can add the one and two inputs. And now what I'm going to do is, because I want all four of these inputs to stereo pairs, I'm actually going to go up and use another element of Wirecast, which are basically called shots. So a shot is a single element like you have down here, but it has the ability now to have its own layers inside that element. So I'm going to go over here to this device, and you can see, so this is the Behringer, and now I'm going to add additional layers. So what I want to do is, again, add audio capture, and I'm going to take the Behringer 3 and 4 inputs and add that. So now what I have stacked into this little shot over here is the audio that I want to be able to use for the production. But say I have additional things. So I want to be able to have remote guest, something that seems to be very popular <laughs> in the uh, last few weeks. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take two of the outputs that we'd have from our live to air system, and I'm going to add those as shots that we can have here. But now, because we're going to have the audio concentrated down in one section, I need to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to mute the audio for these shots because. I really don't want to be able to have this control, you know, switching between these shots control what audio I hear. 
I want to hear the audio from all of these. So I'm just going to take, go into each of these shots, and I mute them. And there's an audio tab inside the Shot com Composer that lets me select what I want to do with this. What I also have to do, since I added those shots, is now I can come in here and I need to add these two sources. Again, so let me go back and add Live to Air 1. And I will add uh, the next one. Sorry, I said uh, th Live to Air 3 and Live to Air 4. So now I have all the audio coming in to this one composition. But in the reciprocal way, where I don't want the audio in the shots, I don't want the video coming in down here in the audio tab. So I'm now going to turn that off. So what I have set up here is something which will allow me to switch between different shots. And I could have a camera shot and other things as well, where the audio may be coming in from the uh, Behringer, you know, through mics or a soundboard. And I have the two remote guests that I have here. However, because I have all my audio set up down on this lower layer here, that audio, no matter which shot is active, will still play. So this is the basic model that we have for working with sources and Wirecast. And I can select different groups of audio that I may want to have. So say I'm working as a church service and I have the band that's playing with the choir and I may want to have an audio source which is just that and then another one which would handle, you know, a, a pulpit or a lectern where a teaching could take place. And I may want to be able to switch between those. So the other element that you get with this approach that Wirecast takes is that it becomes very easy to create these kind of subgroups that I can now just route wherever I need to. But the one downside is that there can only be one subgroup active at a time inside Wirecast. So this gives us you know, a strength because it's very simple to switch between them, but also a weakness you're gonna have to work with where only one can be active. So if you wanted to have somebody monitoring something uh, that wasn't part of the live stream audio at that moment. There's no easy way to do that, you know, directly in Wirecast outside of something they have, which is specifically around the audio monitor that takes place here on the system. So I'll come into that just a little bit, but this is really the general model for how Wirecast works with live audio. And I think it's, you know, for most people, this is, this is perfect. It, it covers pretty much everything that you need. But the other thing to think about now as we, as we configure all this is how do I control this during a production? So in Wirecast, they have an audio mixer. But I'll be honest, it was confusing to me when I first started using it, but it, it, there, there's an intuitive logic to it that once you get it, it kind of makes sense. So if I type control U in Wirecast, what I have is an audio mixer that comes up. But what you see here is nothing. <laughs> there's nothing in this. And the reason is the only thing that shows up in the Wirecast audio mixer is the sources that you have that are live. So in order to get something to show up here, I need to go back over and send everything that I had here live. And now, if you switch back here, you can see all of my audio sources have appeared here. And there's a couple of things to note. Inside the mixer, uh, Wirecast remembered that the video source that I selected, so in this case, it's uh, the Live to Air Channel 4 that's coming in, it was muted. So even though that's an active source and it pushed its audio to it, that audio is muted, which is what we want because we don't want to be taking audio from this, the switches that we do up here. But the audio that's down here in the audio shot that we composited all shows up here. And so now we have the four audio sources that we can pause in that one shot 
that are going to be available. And what's great now is those will be, no matter which camera shot I may take or whatever graphics I put up, those audio sources will now always show up in the mixer. But if I had multiple submixes of audio that I switched between, I couldn't make adjustments to one that wasn't live. So there's that sort of mind switch that you have to get used to where some of the things that you're going to deal with when you're dealing with audio will not be visible to you. And you're going to have to just sort of accept that not everything that you'll be uh, seeing on screen reflects everything that could be active uh, in, the, in the production that you're running. So just something to keep in mind. But a few things now. Uh, one of the key things that we were really excited about uh, with Wirecast is that it gave us the ability to create a monitor mix. And our thinking was, okay, we can just use that monitor mix uh, and apply it any way we wanted to. And the answer is, it doesn't exactly work that way. All the audio sources that are in live go out live. And so anything that I want to do, that will always stream out and be part of the stream. And so the only thing I can do is I can have a submix that is really designed around me listening to the audio as the engineer. But it isn't really designed for streaming out to something else. So for instance, if I were using this with Live to Air or with uh, Zoom, which you know a lot of people are are doing today for for different types of conferences, I would need to have a submix that I could set up, and there is no default way to do that inside of Wirecast, but you can leverage this monitor mix to do that, and you can sacrifice having the operator be able to hear the audio directly. And that's, that's one way that, that seems to, to work really well. I'm, I'll go over the basics for, for how to make that happen. So one of the things that it, they did when they, with Telestream did when they set up the monitor mix was they created a concept called tracks. So if you look down here, let me just switch back to here, there are eight tracks that I can set up. And the reason this was placed inside the monitor mix is that it gave an engineer the ability to listen to all the to, to different groups of audio together. So if I were dialing in the band, then dialing in the pulpit, then dialing in the ambient mics and the congregation mics in a church setting, I could listen to each one of those individually as well as have them all together on a single track. So this is what the track model was worked up, was set up for. And the way that works is it's inside of the shot controls for each one of the shots. So right now I'm up here, I've selected the, uh, the audio shot that we have. And if I go over to the audio specific things, you'll see something there which says channels. And uh, so the channels is where you assign these tracks. You map the different outputs that are available inside this to different tracks. So let me click on the map button here. And what you see now are, these are the audio sources. And understand, these are just, let me move this up so it's a little clearer. These are just the live audio sources that are available. Uh, but I have track one, which has all of them being sent out. So. This gives me now all the different audio sources that are coming into the system are now going out track one. And that is our live track. That will always be the track that goes out with your stream. So if you don't want something in the stream, you can switch it off in track one. And this should cover you. But you now can set up all these other tracks. So in the case where I may be dealing with like live to air or with Zoom, I can go and say, all I really want is the Behringer audio. I want the audio sources in track two that are coming from here in the studio, mics, other types of uh, mixer inputs. But I don't want any of this remote guest audio coming in. 
because what I want to do is I want to be able to send that back to the conference and not have everybody's voices echoing. So by using tracks, I can now set up these different configurations of audio, these different submixes of audio, and I can then leverage that in the monitor mix. So now that I've set this up and I have a second track set up, I will uh, get out of that. And if you go back now to where we were with the mixer, I had the ability to say, where do I want to monitor my audio? So how do I want to send this out? And which track do I want to monitor? So in this case, if we were sending this out to uh, a, you know, a mix or a remote device, I could go back and select the Behringer outputs here. So we have, we have the different outputs that are available here. I could also use Dante Virtual Sound Card. And I could also use a virtual audio device. So say I wanted to send this back through a browser into uh, Zoom or to you know, any one of the, the web conferencing services, I could set that as my monitor output. And so for this case, we'll just set the Behringer because that's what I have set up here. And then I would select track two. And so now, even though this really isn't the design inside of Wirecast, uh, you can sort of hijack this and make it work. And I think that's the most important thing. You know, you may find that there are lots of situations where, you know, a tool doesn't have the exact feature you want, but often it has similar related features. And it's really good to try to figure out ways that you can leverage those in different ways than they were intended. So this is actually something I've had conversations this past week with Telestream about uh, on some other things that we've been doing with them. And you know, I know that they're very aware of this and that it is on their list of things to consider for, for making changes. But what we've done here now is we've created a separate audio mix to send out a mix minus feed to another device downstream. And because it's really flexible and gives us the option for, you know, picking what our monitor mixes is just isn't making a headphone assumption, we now have a lot of power in this. So this could be something where if you needed to have that monitoring locally, you could set up a small external mixer uh, and work with that to, to do some of the audio things. But you may be able to get away with doing something like this and just having enough audio mix available for the operator through cobbling together something like maybe a little distribution amplifier that could take, you know, the output that you have in, in your live stream and feed it back to a headphone mix, something like that. There may be different ways that uh, you can handle that. So this is just one way to do this, but I think it, it gives you a tool that you already have that now you could apply to things, especially today where so many people are trying to, to work with the tools they have but in a remote or web conferencing based set setting. So this would give you a way that uh, you'd be able to do that. And of course, you know, the, the other thing is inside of, if I just go into preferences here, we also have the ability to set whatever audio out we want for the main mix as well. So now I can actually, if I wanted to do something where I was feeding these downstream, I, can, I now have a submix feed and I have my main mix feed, and both of those could be going out an audio device like this. So you have the flexibility there, even if it isn't exactly in the design paradigm that they had set up at Telestream for how Wirecast would be used. So uh, I have probably tempted you know, fate with the uh, gods of internet bandwidth here long enough. But I just wanted to, to sort of jump back in and cover this because I think it's, it's really topical now for what people are trying to do. And also, I think it's something that not a lot of people have had a chance to, to really explore inside of Wirecast because it is so easy to use when, it, when you're just doing exactly what, you know, the, the sort of the design intent of the product is. So this is something where when you have to move outside of that, you definitely might be able to use it. So we will be hanging around after the show for, uh, you know, however long, you know, it makes sense for everybody. And we'll talk about 
anything you want, and I'll share a little bit about what's been going on and what we're doing uh, on the bandwidth front. Uh, but for next week, we'll, we're going to be doing something which looks at how can you make these large multi-box shots inside your productions, especially when you may have a limited number of inputs that you can layer together. Uh, so we're going to look at that, and we're going to specifically focus on the TriCaster, where people are using mix effects buses for uh, their multi-box shots. So that's what we'll be doing next week, and I hope you'll be able to join us again, along with the bandwidth we need for the show. If that would join us again, I'd be very happy. Uh, but until then, uh, I'll, I'll see everybody. If you want to hang around for the after show, that would be great. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. So it has been a while since uh, we've been we've been live, and that's uh, that's been kind of tough for me. Uh, I I really missed the chance to interact with all of you, and I know this has been you know a rough spell for a lot of people. So you know while you know I may you know make light of the the stuff that's going on with the internet, the the overall situation is is certainly something that. You know, it's not a panic situation, but it's something where we should certainly be using a level of uh, caution and care, consideration for others. And uh, probably the other thing is, you know, the fact that we social distance physically doesn't mean uh, we should be removed from, you know, people in our communities uh, just, that just because we can't be with them physically. You know, check in on people, look after people. So uh, it does appear. Uh, that everything that's been going on with the internet has impacted a lot more than you know just us here. We're just outside of the New York area, so there has been a lot of uh, shutdowns, a lot of work from home orders, a lot of curfews put in place. Uh, there are a lot of businesses that are trying to operate with everybody being at home. So you know the internet itself has been stressed especially because so many people are using video uh, as a means to communicate in these times. And I think, on one hand, that's really great because we're, we're starting to see these technologies, as they become mainstream, get creatively applied to a lot of different situations. Uh, the, the situation is unfortunate, but the, the circumstance is unfortunate, but the, the fact that we are starting to figure out how to leverage video technology to interact, conduct business, to perform work, I think is going to, in the long run, be a real benefit. And where I'm seeing it from people that we've had the chance to talk to locally is with schooling, where a lot of the kids, even in grade school, are working remotely and being taught remotely and doing remote assignments. And I think a great mix of that uh, going forward would be something that could benefit a lot of folks, especially where there could be expertise in one area. Uh, you know, somebody that is from a, a company that does research in a certain area that could reach out to high school students and talk about it and give them that type of in-depth uh, understanding of a subject that might not be available from the school they're in. So things like that, that I think as we move past the adjustment phase, some of these changes may be more permanent. And those could be, you know, introduce some really positive things for, you know, the way we're able to connect with people and connect with people that otherwise wouldn't have had the chance to, to interact. So pretty excited about, you know, where that is. And, you know, it's sort of looking for the silver lining, you know, in, in an otherwise dark cloud. But I think, you know, there, that's something we all have to, to think about ourselves is, you know, when we move to the next phase of this, when we sort of get out of being separated, how can we apply some of the lessons learned to do things better than we, we were doing before? And, you know, I think all of us have a role to play in that, you know, since we are at one level or another involved in video streaming and connectivity. So. 
Speaking of connectivity, uh, we have been really hard hit with our bandwidth here. And we share uh, a single business internet connection you know, between the business and the studio. They're on separate networks, but the endpoint of the internet connection is the same. So uh, we know the frustration of not being able to, to do uplink as well as downlink. Sometimes downlink has been terrible. Uh, and that has really been the thing that's impacted us the most with putting the show on the last couple of weeks. We have been trying to come up with some plan Bs. And I know there, you know, certainly if we were doing this professionally, if this were our, our focus as a business, we would have things like, you know, live view units, different types of 4G, uh, cellular available with, with different internet routes that would work very effectively for live streaming specifically. But uh, that isn't something that, because it isn't something we do, we don't really have that as a backup. And it doesn't work as a backup for us as a company because we tend to need very high bandwidth because our solutions are all connectivity-based. And we need high upload and high download bandwidth as a matter of day-to-day -day production work for what we do in development. So what we're going to be doing, and we're exploring this, is oh, we have a, uh, a small 4G LTE modem that we just gotten that we're going to try to set up. And one of the advantages for this is it works on AT&T, which seems to have the best signal coverage in our particular area. But this is something that we can actually put between our hardwired modem and our switches. And it would allow us to switch over to this if the bandwidth on the hardwired connection wasn't good enough. So this is something we're going to get the plan hooked up and get that set up as a backup plan for us here. But uh, again, it took us several weeks to get this in. These, everything uh, locally has been very difficult to come by. So if you needed gear that had anything to do with communications, you can't buy webcams, buying headsets and stuff. So any of these things, uh, if you look online, it's very difficult to, to get right now. And so we, you know, we apologize for everything that went on with, you know, being off air, but we're going to try, you know, within the, the means of this being a uh, sort of a passion project, as I, I mentioned in the comment, you know, within the bounds of that and the budget of that, uh, we're going to, we're going to try and get something up that will always give us some sort of fallback position for getting the stream out. So I guess that's it. I know I've been rambling on here, but I really just wanted to give everybody a bit of a catch up for what we're doing here. And uh, if you do have any questions about, you know, what, uh, you know, what we're going to do more specifically, happy to share, happy to learn. This is, this is somewhat new territory for us because uh, this isn't where we normally focus. But uh, also, you know, if you have any questions about everything we talked about with, with Wirecast or any other you know, switching system for how you can configure it to do these types of things that you may have more demand to do right now. Again, just uh, drop us a line, give us a call, post something on the, the group or the page, and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. So until next week then, I think we're probably uh, tapped out for this week. But uh, until next week, everybody be safe. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I look forward to connecting again on next Friday. Take care, everyone.